Well, good morning and welcome to worship this morning. While you are coming in and finding a seat, I do have several announcements to share with you this morning. Um, I do want to especially thank our youth pastor, Pastor Rod, who, by the way, he and Misty, most of our youth and a bunch of young adults are away at Rock the Universe this weekend. And uh, I told him, I said, you want to hear casting crowns over my preaching? How terrible is that? But uh, they are away. They're due back this afternoon. They've been away for their uh, weekend retreat, having a great time. So remember them as they travel back today. But I want to thank Pastor Rod and uh, Brother Ralph for filling in for me last Sunday. Uh, most of you know I had the privilege of speaking at a men's retreat last week up in Georgia. had an incredible time sharing God's word with a just uh, amazing group of, of guys. And so thank you for your prayers. Uh, but I certainly miss my church family and am grateful to be back today. I shared Wednesday night that I'm especially back, glad to be back in one piece without any injuries. You know this preacher, he is a very, very, very casual hunter. That means if I can sit in the stand that is covered with a nice chair and a pillow, I like hunting. Beyond that, I don't, but uh, did a lot of shooting and skeet shooting, and you'll be proud that your pastor actually got involved in axe and knife throwing and did not get hurt. It was amazing. But uh, I, I'm not going to say about any of the other guys that might have been standing around. But now, thank you so much for your prayers. Had an incredible time sharing God's word with them uh, up there. And it is especially nice to see one of my favorite people in the whole world here today, Miss Betty. It is so good to see you today. Miss Donna's mom here with us. All right, several announcements. Don't forget, tonight our 6 o'clock Bible study is not meeting, but we are having our 5th Sunday night contemporary worship service tonight, and uh, we hope you'll come back and join us for that special ministry tonight, 6 o'clock right here in the sanctuary. Our schedule for Wednesday night is a normal Wednesday night with dinner and all of our activities and things Going on Thursday night is Ladies Bible Study, first and third Thursday of each month. Ladies Bible Study, they meet at 6 o'clock. They have a light supper and Bible study time and would love to have any ladies come and join them. You do not have to be a member of our church. Just come and join them Thursday night at 6 o'clock over in the Family Life Center. And then also want to remind the guys in our men's ministry we are not having our monthly Tuesday night meeting this month. Instead, we are having a men's ministry work day on Saturday, February 18th. We'll give you some more instructions about that as it gets a, another week or so, but get that date on your calendar, men's ministry work day on Saturday the 18th. There are a number of other announcements in our weekly church bulletin, so... If you did not get a copy, make sure you get a copy before you go today so you can be aware of all of our opportunities for ministry here at First Baptist. If you are visiting with us today, we're especially glad to have you join us for our time of worship today. If it's the first time that you've been at a worship service here at First Baptist, we've got a packet of information that we'd like to give to you. We hope you'll take that packet home with you look over the information about our church and ministry during the week, but you will find a visitor's card inside that packet. If you would, pull that card out, fill out the appropriate information on it, and later in our service, when we take up our offering, we don't expect our guests to give financially, but we would love for you to put that completed visitor's card in the offering plate so we have a record of your visit with us today. We want to welcome you, give you the visitor's packet. We certainly don't want to embarrass you, so we ask our first-time visitors, if you would, remain seated 
Church family, let's stand in honor of our guests and let's share a welcome song together this morning. As you're going back to your places this morning, you may be seated. An incredible time in Bible study this morning. Uh, as we travel chronologically, it have been through the Old Testament and uh, looked at the book of Esther this morning and the remarkable story of God preserving his people. If you're not attending Sunday school, Bible study with us on Sunday morning, we'd love to have you come back and join us for that uh, each Sunday morning. As we prepare our hearts for prayer corporately together this morning, I do want you to especially remember Brother Ernie Collins. I had a visit with Ernie this week. He's doing a little bit better, um, not near as much pain as he has had. Uh, we'll probably be there in the rehab center for several months, and uh, so keep him in your personal prayer time as well. Brother Ralph Daniel is going to come and lead us in a word of prayer. Go to the word, Lord, in prayer. Father, we come to the. We come to worship you, Father. And we just ask, Father, that you would quiet our hearts, shut out the problems that we have with the world, and come sit at your throne, Father, and listen to you. We pray that you would use Brother Jim in a mighty way, Father, in the message today. And we do thank you, Lord, that Brother Ernie is doing a little bit better. And we pray for those who are still recuperating. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Y'all join us as we worship this morning. I have decided to follow Jesus.
sing that one more time, we're going to be happy about it. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon. did my heart some good right there. Were you smiling? Yeah, we were smiling. Good. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord, we are so thankful for this day you've given us, for being allowed to be in your house of worship this morning. Amen. Please bless the gifts and the giver as we collect these offerings. Amen. Jesus calling us out 
on the grave like Lazarus, your brand new. The power of death couldn't hold you. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? Rise up, rise up, rise up, out from the grave. Filled your veins it was more than blood, it's the kind of love that washes sin away. And the door is open wide, and the storm's been rolled aside. The old is gone, the light has come, so come on in. If you like music like that, you're going to want to be here tonight at 6 o'clock. It is just going to be awesome. I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. Familiar verses in the 6th chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 33 and 34. Matthew, chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. Continuing our series this month on preparing for the new year and what God has for us as individuals and as well as in our local church. Our message today is entitled, I'm Ready for the Year. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, and when you find that place in your copy of God's Word, I would invite you out of reverence to God's Word to bow your head with me this morning. I would invite you even more so to bow your heart before God. And take the next few moments of quiet meditation time and invite God to speak to your heart this morning. Take a few moments in silent prayer. Then I'll lead us in a word of prayer and read our text for today. Heavenly Father, you have called us to this place today to worship you. And as we've gathered and fellowshiped, as we have prayed and given and sung praises, pray that they come from genuine hearts. And I pray that as we spend the next few moments in your precious word, that we hear from you today. Thank you for your presence in this place today, and bless your precious word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. The Bible says, But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Be therefore not anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for the things of itself. Sufficient unto that day is its own evil. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. We have been looking this month at preparing our hearts and lives for the coming year. We do that tenured with the very fact that God doesn't promise us a year, a month, or even another day. But we gear and we have short and long-range plans, always tethered to the very fact that Jesus Christ is coming at any time. And we often ask the question, what will this year hold for me? Do you know? Of course not. Will it hold blessing? Tragedies? I'm sure if it's like every other year in my life and probably yours, if God gives us another year, it'll hold both blessings and tragedies. We talked the first Sunday about having some New Year's resolutions, and we looked at the book of Psalms for that. We then looked at the book of Ezra and preparing our hearts for God to do a work in us. Two weeks ago, we looked in the book of Philippians about that key thing that all of us do, and that is to worry about things. I'm not sure what this year has in store for me, for my family. I don't know what this year may have in store for our local church, but I do know one thing. I know the one who holds the whole year in his hands. How many here are old enough to remember watching the 1980 Olympic hockey game between the United States and Russia? Okay, some of you were not around then, but you've seen it on tape probably. I was in Bible college when it happened with a group of many other students. Joseph Stoll, an incredible preacher and author, he recalls watching the 1980 Olympic hockey game. If you know anything about United States Olympics, you know that in those days in the United States, unlike the rest of the world, we did not allow professional athletes to compete in the Olympics, only amateurs. The rest of the world used professionals. And so when the United States was playing Russia in the finals of the hockey for the gold medal, no one expected the United States to win or hardly even compete with the professionals of Russia. But as we watched the game tied into the last period and saw the United States score a goal, the place where I was erupted with just kind of enthusiasm. But then we had to sit through the rest of the game on the edge of our seats, and Joseph Stoll says, I sat there on the edge of my seat wondering, can we hang on? Will the Russian score go? Will they tie it? Will they go ahead? Can we hold on? And we do, and the United States wins the gold medal, without a doubt the greatest time ever in the history of the Olympics in mine and many other people's memory. And then the next night, he said, I invited some friends over to watch, re-watch the game. And they all came over, we sat down in front of the television, and we watched the game. The night before, I sat on the edge of my seat, worried, biting my nails, not sure we were going to even be able to stay in the game long enough to make it a tie, and we win. And now tonight, I find myself sitting on the couch, my feet propped up eating popcorn, having a great time watching the game once again. He said, you know why? Because I knew what the outcome was. I knew we were going to win. And it was the defining moment, he says, that reminded me as a child of God that regardless of what may happen, what may be going on in our lives or even the world today, we know who holds the year, we know who holds the future, and we know 
the outcome. And as we prepare for a year, if God gives it to us, I want to share three simple points. You can find them right here in the Word. You know, sometimes as preachers, we try to write fancy outlines. We try to start them all with the same letter or a key word in it to make it sound really good. You know, sometimes you cannot improve on the outline that God gives us. It's simple, okay? So here's the three points. They're going to be mind-boggling. You're going to say, preacher, how in the world could you have come up with this outline by yourself? You ready? Three points, okay? One, seek God first. Two, live righteously. And three, do not worry about tomorrow. I know what you're thinking, man. You are a genius when it comes to writing outlines, okay? Seek God first. Live righteously, and don't worry about tomorrow. Seek God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's not about just making God the number one priority in your life. In fact, years ago, as I began to study this verse and what it really meant for me personally, I had a few people say, is God number one in your life? Is he the number one priority? And I'd go, no. And they'd look and go, you're a preacher. He has to be number one. I said, no, God's not the number one priority in my life. God doesn't want to be the number one priority in my life. And when you're a preacher and you say that, it gets their attention because then they focus on something's going on. And I said, no, God doesn't want to be the priority in my life. He wants to have preeminence in all of my life. He doesn't want to just be number one and then I go on to all the other things. He wants to be number one in all the areas of my life. Because sometimes we kind of think, I went to church on Sunday, it's the first day of the week, and so... I crossed God off my list of priorities. He was first. Church was important. I went there. Crossed off. No. God wants to be number one in your family, in your marriage, in your relationships. God wants to be number one when you go to school. God wants to be number one in your job. He wants to have preeminence in every single area of our life. Huh. I'm reminded of a true story, a young man who got his very first job working at a department store in Rochester, Texas, the article came. And he'd been working for about a month when his boss came to him and said, things have changed, schedules are changing, you must now work on Sundays uh, where you haven't had to before. And the young man said, sir, I I, I can't work on Sunday. I go to church on Sunday. It's important to me. And the boss said, well, you either can work on Sundays or I can fire you and not have your job. And the young man said, then you'll have to fire me. Several days later, the young man applied for a position as a teller at a bank. The bank manager was calling his only previous employer, the manager of the department store, and he called him and he said to him, I am calling about a former employee of yours and uh, just calling to see whether you would give a good reference. And the department store manager said, I would be glad to give him a very good reference. I just fired him the other day. And the bank manager said, no, 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 wait. You're going to give him a good reference <laughs> and then tell me you fired him a few days ago. And the department store manager said, here are the circumstances. I can tell you that if he's not willing to rob from God with his time, he won't rob you of your money. God doesn't just want to be the first priority that you have. We don't check him off and then say, now I can get to the rest of my life, even if it's involved with many good things. He wants to be preeminent in every single area of our life. In your marriage, if you're married. In your family. If you're still working. In your career. I know most of our students, at least young people, are away. And you know when they get back, they'll just be dying to listen to the preacher's sermon. He wants to be number one in school. He wants the preeminence in all of our life. Seek God 
more than you seek anything else in life. Second thing that he tells us is to live righteously. I can tell you that I have seen in my time of ministry many people fail in life because they didn't follow the first principle, they didn't seek God first. But I can also tell you that I've seen many folks, church members, who have failed at their Christian life, not because they didn't want to put God first, they, they did. But for many of us, we fail when it comes to the second part, and that is living righteously. Because that's where you and I live on a day-to-day basis. We are called to be obedient to God's Word. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He's speaking about death and the resurrection. And in the very middle of that chapter, he says, I die daily. I die every day. Now Paul was writing that, and in retrospect, he was reminding us of how he lived his life. That every day he was dead to self and alive to Christ. And that's an absolute good principle and we should live by that that i put myself down and i lift god up in my life okay that's a good principle but when he's speaking in first corinthians chapter 15 he's not talking about dying daily in our obedient walk to christ he's actually talking about dying daily because i love it when he writes on he says to them every day i face death Every day, I realize it could very well be my last day. I may again enrage people in my preaching of the gospel, and they may decide to kill me by stoning me like has happened many times in my life. I may be arrested like I have in my life, Paul would say. Like in Ephesus, when I was put in prison. And we didn't know it at the time when he's writing in the book of Acts, and we don't even get it in the book of Ephesians, but he gives us a little snippet of it in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, whether I get eaten by animals in the arena, or I die in what other way? I realize that every single day, not only must I die to myself and my own wants and desires, I also realize that because of my faith in Christ and because of my willingness to live God out and make Him preeminent in every area of my life, that I face the very real prospect of dying today. And it's interesting because he uses that to then go on and say, you know what? whether it be in prison or killed by animals in the arena, he asked the question, why would I be willing to die for my faith if I didn't believe there was a resurrection from the dead? And that's what the rest of the chapter will tell us about in 1 Corinthians 15. I've read it many times at many funerals and gravesides. But do you catch what Paul is saying? Why would I be willing to die? Maybe stoned to death. Maybe beaten. Maybe put in the arena and mauled and killed by wild animals. Why would I be willing to do that if I didn't believe in the resurrection. I have no idea what this year will hold for me, and nor, neither do you. But there are some things I'm sure of. Some things I'm absolutely sure of. I know that if I die, I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. Not because I'm a preacher. In fact, the Bible tells us there'll be many preachers who go to hell. 
I'm not going because I'm a preacher. I'm not going to go because I was a good husband, a good father, good grandfather. I'm not going to go because I was a good person. Many of you have heard me say for years, I thought if my good things outweighed my bad things, I'd somehow slip into heaven on the scales of justice. And then I learned that nobody's going to make it to heaven on all the good things they've done. If we've done one sin or more, we're going to be destined for hell. And I realized, just like everybody else, that was me. And then I realized that it wasn't about doing. It was about what God did for me. And Paul shares about the resurrection of Jesus Christ who hung on a cross and died. And he rose again so that we could have Forgiveness for our sins and victory over death. So because of what the Bible says, not even always because of how I feel, but because God says, you can know that you have eternal life. It's the greatest truth I ever came to grips with in my life, that you could know that you're going to heaven. I heard my dad say it over and over and over, know that you know that you know that you know. Pastor Rod says it often, that you know that you know that you know that you're going to be in heaven. And when I came to recognize that God said, if you're willing to put your faith and trust in my son Jesus Christ, and you're willing to confess or tell me you're sorry for your sin, that I will forgive you. I'll adopt you. And you'll be mine Heaven is yours for eternity. So for me, at the age of 18, I happened to be in a church service on a Sunday night. I went forward and did just what God's Word said. I told God, God, I am sorry for all of my sin. Please forgive me. And I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus as the way. And I accept Him. And I'm giving you my life right here. I could never have imagined at the age of 18 what God would have for me in store. I can imagine that if you could have given me a little snippet and, hey, said, when you're in your 60s, you're going to be in a place called Waldo. <laughs> I just said, uh-uh. <laughs> and you're going to be the preacher. Could never have imagined it. But this I know. He not only holds the year, he holds me, Jesus said, in Jesus' hand and in the hand of the Father. And that if I die today, I'm going to be in heaven. And that's a decision for each individual to make. No one makes it for you. If you're willing to tell God you're sorry for your sin, you're willing to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and give the Lord your life, God will forgive you and adopt you. In a few minutes, we'll have an invitation and invite folks to come and pray at the front of our church about different things. And I'll be standing right here at the front. You're not sure about your relationship with God. You don't know that you're going to spend eternity in heaven. If you're willing to come his way, God, I'm sorry. I trust Christ. Here's my life. We'd love to talk to you about that before you go today. I'll be standing right and just come and say, Pastor, I don't know. I'd like to know. I'd like to make the decision. I've got some questions, whatever it is. We'll take a few minutes of your time and sit down with you and share that with you. The greatest decision you'll ever make in your life because it matters for all of eternity. Huh. Paul says, whether I live, whether I die, however I die, it doesn't matter because I know there's a resurrection waiting for me. And by the way, he goes on before I go to the last point here. He goes on to say something really unique. And you can read it there in 1 Corinthians 15 when you get home. I'll paraphrase it a little bit. He said, he said, I could have and would have the world's philosophy. I'd have the world's philosophy of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we all die. I'd have that philosophy if I didn't know that eternity was coming 
And it was either hell or heaven. Sadly, that is most of the people that you will meet this week. Sadly. Sadly. Most of the people that you will meet. They, they might not tell you they don't believe in God. Some will, but many of the folks you'll meet this week say, yeah, I, I kind of believe in God. But they won't know where they're going to spend eternity. They'll continue to live the life like everybody else. Yeah, live my life for myself. Try to bring some joy and happiness and when I die, I die. Paul says, I could have that philosophy, but I know that there's something waiting when I die. See God first, live righteously, and then don't worry about tomorrow. We talked about this in, in detail two weeks ago. We won't repeat it all. You can go back and look it up online or whatever and uh, have to see the sermon about worry. And we learned that prayer and obedience were the two keys to victory over worry, not just stop doing it, but we had to have a biblical perspective. Remember what God says worry is, and then in prayer and obedience. And now Jesus says to them, and by the way, how do we know it's Jesus speaking? Yeah, if you got a red letter Bible, then you know that he said it, you know. Okay? Uh, just seeing if you're still awake. Okay? Jesus said, Don't worry about tomorrow. And I love it because he says, Sufficient unto the day is its own evil. Kind of a strange statement, isn't it? Sufficient unto the day is his own evil. He's, he's essentially telling us that every single day has its own worries and challenges and troubles. You don't need to worry about them today. Tomorrow there'll be troubles. Tomorrow there'll be circumstances. And worrying about it's not going to help at all. In your history books at school, you probably read or heard about Sir Walter Scott. Explorer. The last entry that he made in his personal diary, very last entry in his diary, was, tomorrow we shall... Tomorrow we shall... Last entry. He didn't die the next day. But he suffered a series of strokes that would rather quickly take his life. And at the age of 61, he would die. The last penned words we have that we know of from him, from his own personal di diary, tomorrow we shall. Drove down to near Leesburg one day this week, and on my way, got down around Leesburg and Tavares and, you know, all them places to kind of run together. And, and it was rather unusual because in, a, in an area where I got down there around Leesburg and Tavares, I, I, I kept noticing different psychic reader or Madam so-and-so, or palm reader, or tarot card. I know a number of businesses like that. I know there are businesses like that. I know we have them in Gainesville. But, but I, noticed a, I noticed a bunch of them, you know, and I thought, man, I have lots of people that come and ask me, you know, for advice, or what's going to happen tomorrow, or and I thought, man, I could, uh, I could start a business. And I could start it on a pretty simple premise. Future readings by St. James. Hey, hey, catchy, isn't it? And I'd only charge $10. I started to ask, does anybody know what the going rate is? But I didn't want somebody to answer and then make them embarrassed. But, you know. Special today, $10. And then when it came in and sat down in front of me, I could say. Remember Johnny Carson, anybody? Yeah, some of you are old. All right. Tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring both blessing and trouble.
right? They couldn't walk out and live the next day and go, he didn't have a clue what he was talking about. Tomorrow will bring blessing and trouble. For five more dollars, I will tell you something else. And if they gave me the five dollars, here's what I would say. I wrote it down because, you know, this is a great idea. Tomorrow, not everything will be as good as it could. Give me five more dollars and I'll give you one more. Not everything will be as bad as it could. The only problem I would have would be I wouldn't be able to say that that was all original with me. I'd have to say I, I, I didn't get it from me. I got it from God's Word. You know, that's what God's Word says. Jesus said, sufficient tomorrow. I can tell you, without a doubt, that you'll have both blessing and trouble tomorrow. And nothing will be as good as it could be. And maybe someone here today that's going to need to remember that today or tomorrow. And maybe some will need to remember that nothing will be as bad as it could be. Hmm. I read a story, I don't know or even imagine that it is true, I can't tell you. I always try to find stories that are true, I don't know and kind of doubt this one is, but I hope you'll get the point of it. A man in his 60s, which caused me to read it because that's me, a man in his 60s lost his sight. Over the course of several days, his sight left and he was completely blind. He went to the doctor and the doctor examined him and said, I see what's going on. I have some medication for you to take. Go home, take the medication. It'll take several days for it to work and... Uh, so the man went home, he began taking the medication, and over the course of the next two or three or four days, his sight came back. But the degree to which his sight came back, his memory got worse. So that by the end of the four days, he had perfect sight, but he had lost memory of everything. And he went back to the doctor doctor said, I'm sorry, but what you have has given you a choice. You can either have your sight or your memory. And in the story, the man says, and the point of the sermon or the point of the illustration was, I'd rather have my sight than my memory because I'd rather see where I'm going than where I've been. And I said, yeah. Fits right with the sermon. But then I began to think about my own life. What if I was faced with that choice? On one hand, I thought, yeah, I'd rather see where I'm going than where I've been, but then, uh-uh. No. I got some awesome memories. Memories of meeting my wife and marrying having children. 
raising them up. And going to baseball games and basketball games with our son. Trailering horses to events with our daughter. Vacations we've taken together to many different places. And then, you know, blessed with a grandson almost three years ago that we never thought would happen. And, you know, I'm a tad attached to him. And Friday morning, Grammy left. Not for marital reasons. <laughs> Grammy left to go spend the weekend with her sister down in Newport Ritchie which was fine, I can eat out. <laughs> have enough clothes till she gets back. But she almost didn't leave Friday morning because she takes care of our grandson, Colton. And she said, wait, I, I can't go till Friday afternoon till, I said, hello? I am perfectly capable of taking care of him. And of course, y'all know the look on her face was, yeah. I said, I've got a great idea. You need to get a really early start on Friday morning. So here's what Colton and I will do. We will take you to Cracker Barrel for breakfast early. Then you can just go right down the road to your sister's, and him and I will have the day together. He reluctantly agreed. And so we had breakfast. If you know my grandson, he walked into Cracker Barrel. He greeted every single person with the same question Got pancakes? <laughs> got pancakes? And they all said, We got pancakes. And he'd smile. And we sat down and had breakfast. And then we said goodbye to Grammy. And I said, you want to go see the four-wheelers and the boats and the fish at Fast Pro? <laughs> so we went there. And he sat on every single one they had. Then we went back and looked at the fish. And then he said, got toys? And I said, and we spent the day together. And then we came back home at lunchtime. And I gave him some lunch. And then he said, Papa, nap. That's what I was waiting for. <laughs> Not because I'm old and tired. But because when Papa's there and he takes a nap, we get in the recliner. I get a pillow and I hold him in my lap. talk to him and I just rub his little hand and arm and he just looks at me till the eyes close and goes to sleep. There's nothing better. And I got to thinking what if I had to choose between my sight and my memory? And I thought I wouldn't give up my memories for my sight. I don't even have to think about it now. And sometimes it's in those very moments that God speaks to a heart like mine. And he reminded me of a very important spiritual principle. Maybe because I'm not where God really, really, really wants me to be. Because I tend to get a lot more focused on this life. 
instead of eternity and what's coming. And I've got to remember that all those things I have here won't matter. When eternity comes, only the ones in Christ will be there. So for me, it was a tough moment to say, Lord, help me to be willing to let go of anything in my life that would draw my attention away from you. I don't know what this year holds, but I can tell you I know who holds the year. And I know that if I don't make another day that I'm going to spend eternity in heaven because I put my faith and trust in Christ, and you can too. And if you haven't, we'd love to talk to you about it before you go. God's called us. He doesn't want to be just first priority. He wants the preeminence in every area of our lives. And whatever comes, blessing or trouble, he's there. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Heads bowed. If you're not sure about your relationship with God, you don't know that you're going to spend eternity in heaven, we would love to talk to you before you go. Take a few minutes of your time and sit down with God's word and share with you how you can know. To my brothers or sisters, I know that if God gives you another day, there's going to be blessings and troubles. Maybe this morning you'd just like to come to the altar and say, God, thank you for reminding me that you will be with me. Maybe to come to the altar and say, God, I need you to be with me through this. Maybe there's someone you'd like to come and pray for because you know they're going through a difficult or struggle time right now. But here's my challenge to you. Are you willing to say, God, help me to know that there isn't anything in my life more important than you. And I'd invite you to come to an altar this morning and just between you and God say, God, I want you to have preeminence. Father, I pray that you bless our invitation time now. I pray that we'd be willing to be obedient in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed this morning. As our instrumentalist begins to play, our invitations open. And I invite you to come while he plays this morning to make this your altar this morning. Not sure about your relationship with God? Come, I'm right here. Come, make it your altar. Worship today, remember our group of young people, young adults and others, uh, some of them are not so young, that uh, coming back from the, the retreat at Rock the Universe this weekend today. And then of course, especially, come and join us tonight for a special uh, new ministry. We're kicking off a night of, of uh, contemporary Christian music and uh, some preaching in the Word. And uh, join us for that at 6 o'clock tonight. Grab a bulletin if you didn't get one before you came so you can be reminded of all of our opportunities for ministry. And if you visited with us today, thank you so much for joining us. It is an honor to have you today. It really is. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your presence here today. I'm grateful that you not only hold me, but you hold this year. So grateful. And we all know 
that if, if you give us another day, that there'll be blessings and troubles. Grateful to have you. Lord, bless us as we go from this place today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.